Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for this introduction. Thank you all for coming to my talk. As uh, Christina pointed out, I'm speaking about the mathematics of post-quantum cryptography in the AI era. So at the beginning, I give a story and how the field is uh, moving and so on. And then I will, in the end, I will have a um, few slides to continue um, real applications of pure mathematics, in particular group theory in cryptography. So we have some math also. So I start uh, with motivation of quantum thread. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, RSA encryption, which is an encryption um, function based on prime factorization. So you know um, multiplying two large prime is relatively fast. But if you have a large prime, it takes a long time to break it to its factor. And this has been used for cryptography. In particular, as you know, uh, when you have a key exchange, two people want to communicate over insecure channel. They want to agree on a key to use it for communication, uh, further communication. It's based on a so-called one-way function, which is easy to compute, hard to find the inverse. By easy to compute, I mean in polynomial time, hard to find the inverse, hopefully in exponential time. And uh, this idea of using uh, factorization uh, integer factorization has been used in encryption. And uh, we are currently using uh, many of these systems. So in 1994, a, an MIT professor, Peter Shore, came up with a quantum polynomial time algorithm to, um, to basically break the, this RSA encryption, uh, prime factorization, uh, in the uh, in about some hours, uh, so quantum polynomial time. And classically, in classical computers, uh, breaking, um, say, RSA 2048 bits, it takes, uh, I don't know, 400 years or so. So you may say, well, in order to break this system, you need uh, enough qubits. So it has been lots of efforts uh, to uh, come up with uh, powerful enough quantum computers, large-scale quantum computers. And um, for example, as you could see in 2023, um, IBM Condor could do 1,121 qubits. Uh, so let's continue on the risk status. Uh, so there is a recent paper by Gidney and Ekera that uh, shows how to factor a 2048-bit RSA integers in eight hours using 20 million qubits. So you may say, well, you just told us that uh, we don't have large-scale quantum computers. So what is the paranoid estimate? So the paranoid estimate is that researchers estimate that um, around eight, nine years, uh, there will be powerful enough quantum computers uh, to, to break uh, RSA, say, 2048 bit in the uh, about like uh, eight, nine years or so. So there is also a notion of store now, decrypt later. So one can uh, store the data now, uh, confidential data now. And uh, that, OK, we don't have uh, powerful enough quantum computers to break it. But then when in some years, when there will be large scale quantum computers, one can break it. So this is another danger in some ways. So you may ask me, what's the solution? The solution is post-quantum cryptography, or we call it PQC. So these are basically new hard problems secure against the quantum computers. In some cases, MP-complete or MP-hard problems. And there has been some proposals. For example, um, the most famous one that's 
uh, currently being deployed is uh, lattice-based cryptography, which is based on shortest vector problem or learning with error, LWE problem. And then you have code-based, isogeny-based, which was broken for some cases. Um, and also two areas that I'm interested in is this multivariate cryptography. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, group-based cryptography in which um, uh, we use uh, hard algorithmic uh, group theoretic problems for um, cryptography. Um, so let's look into post-quantum standardization. So after Snowden's revelation in 2016, um, uh, so there was a message by the United States National Institute of Standard Technology, NIST, that said quantum risk is now simply too high and can no longer be ignored. And there has been a process, ongoing process, for new quantum resistant um, cryptographic standard through NIST, uh, which um, the round one was around uh, 2016 to 2018. So researchers globally come up with uh, cryptographic algorithms and, uh, uh, you know, and then the other researchers try to attack them and then they propose new parameters and then they attack them. So it's like back and forth and there are many uh, aspects to this. For example, you need to do crypto analysis, classical crypto analysis, the, you know, so many um, factors coming to play. And finally, in uh, 2022, in July 22, um, NIST made the announcement for the finalists, uh, which were, um, they announced one CHEM, that stands for key encapsulation mechanism. For example, key exchanges are part of them. And as such, uh, one of the lattice-based uh, crypto systems known as Crystal Kyber was um, made it to the final step. And three DSS digital signature schemes known as Dilithium, Falcon, Sphinx, um, two lattice-based and one hash-based were announced. And at the same year, uh, they made an announcement for new, uh, uh, for, 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 for a call for competition for um, additional digital signature schemes because they were either very slow or the signature wasn't short and, and so on and so forth. So let's look at a more and more regulated context. So in France also, uh, this has been, um, done, but uh, I, I'm in the United States, so I thought to make a note about what's going on in United States. So in January 2022, there was a memo on improving the cybersecurity on, of national security. In the January same year, uh, there was a memo on Quantum Computing Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. And in March 23, 2023, there was a release of national cybersecurity strategy that one of the objective, uh, strategic objective uh, is shift liability for insecure software products and services. And another uh, strategic objective is prepare for uh, our post-quantum future. So you see the importance of this. So in this part of the talk, after this introduction, I would like to see, to tell you how uh, the work that I, um, I did my uh, mathematical training in group theory. And uh, I want to show you how purely mathematical topics could be uh, employed in a cryptographic scheme uh, and well, to be post-quantum cryptographic schemes that are secure, even if large-scale quantum computers will be invented. If you're interested to learn more, I wrote a feature article in the American Mass Society uh, notices. It's online. You can read it in uh, May 23. 
And my book also published uh, last February on this topic. But to begin with, I have to tell you the motivation for post-quantum uh, group-based cryptography. That's what we call it. So first of all, I would like to mention that uh, cryptography, uh, for example, RSA or Diffie-Hellman, they all use um, groups, but in which those groups are finite, uh, abelian or cyclic, however you want to call it, but they are abelian, meaning that the elements of these groups commute. You know, like 5 times 2 is the same as 2 times 5, so they commute, elements commute. But the groups that uh, I consider in this talk, they are so-called non-commutative, non-abelian, in which some of the elements, or maybe all of the elements, do not really commute. So one of the motivations for group-based cryptography is, um, first of all, it's relatively um, understudied family in post-quantum cryptography with potential due to uh, recent results that we received. Uh, we have a diverse roster of computational problems, some prove to be NP-hard. And also there are some groups in which there are infinite. Uh, there are infinite groups. And there is a there is a bridge between the Schwartz quantum algorithm that I presented at the beginning and group theoretic problem known as hidden subgroup problem. And uh, there is a conjecture by um, Greg Cooperberg, who states that um, f the, this hidden subgroup problem for infinite group, non-abelian infinite group, is NP-hard. Um, there has been many platforms that are uh, proposed. Um, the ones on these sides are my work with uh, many collaborators, experts in the field. And today I will tell you about the second one, higher dimensional special linear groups over finite fields. These groups you are familiar with. Um, they are basically um, n by n matrices in which the determinant is one and the elements are coming from finite fields, field of uh, some prime order and so on. There has been other, so if I have time and if you're interested, I will also tell you about how you can use graph groups. And uh, there has been many other uh, platforms has been proposed. For example, Braid Group has been proposed at the beginning in 1999, based on the fact and belief that the conjugacy search problem in such groups is, is very hard. So I must note that uh, some of these problems uh, even, even in the case of the standardization, some of these problems have been um, theoretically, computational complexity theoretically has been shown to be NP-hard, but sometimes uh, we just based our belief based on the fact that these problems experimentally is hard or no one could find a fast algorithm for them yet. So what are these problems? For example, discrete logarithm problem, which is I'm going to present to you, um, it's a known problem that uh, one of the classical key exchanges based on, known as Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so it's a discrete log problem, but over some uh, finite uh, cyclic group. But this problem can be uh, defined for non-commutative groups and uh, with different complexity, basically. And then there are many other um, problems. And I must note that these problems are hard in a specific group, not in all groups. Uh, for example, there are, um, so for example, in the case of graph groups that I'm going to present if I have time, the subgroup isomorphism problem could be MP, MP hard. And I mentioned about conjugacy problem and, and so on and so forth. So you see, like this is, as I mentioned, there is a long roster of the problems here. I must uh, mention that in the case of, say, uh, lattices or code base or isogeny or multivariate and all that, there is one problem that they consider to be hard. 
and then they have a crypto system based on that. But you see the group theoretic problems are quite rich. You can find many applications uh, based on different problems. Um, so I mentioned about the hidden subgroup problem, which is a bridge between the Shor's algorithm and um, quantum algorithm and the um, group theoretic problem. So I thought to uh, bring you a little bit uh, math of how we discuss. So consider on top a finitely generated group G, groups in which they have finite generators, and uh, consider um, an efficiently computable function f from this um, finitely generated group G to some finite set S, um, such that, um, and then consider H, which is a finitely generated subgroup of this group with finite index. Um, so how do you define the hidden subgroup problem? So the way you define it is the following. So you want this uh, function f from g to this finite set s be such that it is constant and distinct on left cosets of a subgroup h. So you see like these two, these are the cosets, these two elements distinct goes to one element. And you see in every element, every coset they are distinct. So the question we want here is to find the generating set for H. And the way you present the group um, to quantum compute, to quantum algorithm, you show it as a superposition, which is here is like one over the or square root of the order of the group times the sum of the superposition of the elements. So you see that if the group is infinite, 1 over infinity is kind of odd. So uh, you can uh, come up with different way to present it. But to just begin with, you can think about it. That's how you present the group. So I mentioned to you about discrete log problem. So I would like to mention about discrete uh, log problem application in the classical setting and then generalize it to more complex group theoretic way to see if we could come up with a so-called post-quantum crypto system. So just to remind you of this um, key exchange problem is a public key exchange known as Diffie-Hellman by two mathematicians, Diffie and Hellman, in 1976. So the idea is that two people, they call them in cryptography, Alice and Bob, want to communicate over insecure channel. There are some public information that, I don't know, they publish it on their website. It's like public, everyone knows it. So this consists of a finite cyclic group, usually of order P. And the way you present this group is multiplicatively. And uh, then Alice send, uh, pick a random natural number A and compute G to power A modulo P, this prime P, and send G to power A mod P to Bob. And Bob does similar thing. He picks a random natural number B and computes g to power b modulo p and sends g to power b to Alice. So now g is public, g to power a is public, g to power b is public, and p is public, right? And note that the power a and b are coming from integers, right? And in integer numbers, they commute. a times b is the same as b times a. So they commute. So in other words, if you consider Alice can compute g to power b, because g to power b is public, a is her secret, and so she can make g to power b a. And Bob can compute g to power a b, which k a is the same as k b. So they agree on the same shared key. Yeah? 
So the security assumption, well, roughly speaking, there are more sophisticated way to talk about this, but the security assumption is as follows, to recover GAB from G, G, A, G, B. So this is assuming to be hard, you know, or you can uh, talk about discrete log problem to recover A from G and G, A. So we say this is hard. So this is a security assumption for this Diffie-Hellman key exchange problem. So let's look at the variation on Diffie-Hellman. So the idea is that Alice and Bob both have g to power a and g to power b. So what if they just multiply g a times g b? Well, both of them get the same shared key, right? But the drawback is, what's the drawback? Everyone else can do it, right? But we want to get this idea and see how we can uh, impose it to another group theoretic structure in which we can kind of borrow from this idea. Um, so I'm not going to go too much to the detail of, of this uh, so-called uh, semi-direct product structure, but just to give you big ideas to see how powerful pure math could be. So, for example, consider two groups, G and H, and consider um, odd G to be the group of automorphism, and define the semi-direct product, oh, and then consider rho from H to odd G, and define semi-direct product of these groups, gamma, to be this uh, pair G, H, such that G is in G, H is in H, and then I need to define the multiplication. So when you multiply g h by g prime h prime, you multiply the second component h and h prime. So it's the same. And for this first one, it's a little bit of twist. And that's what is going to help us. Because in the product that you're familiar with, perhaps you're familiar with the direct product in which both of these groups are normal, so-called normal in the big group. But here it's like one of them is normal. And uh, you can make it a bit more uh, easier in the sense that you can consider the second group H to be the whole automorphism group of G. So in that case, phi and phi prime coming from automorphism of G and the multiplication looks kind of better. You know, so how can I use it? So this one I did uh, in 2023, 11 years ago, with uh, my two PhD students, former PhD students and collaborator. And uh, the idea is that, um, so the public information is G, an element G in G, and an automorphism uh, or sometime endomorphism if you consider semi-groups. Uh, so these are public. And now Alice chooses a private key M, natural number, and inductively computes G phi to power M. The same way that I told you how to multiply in the semi-direct product setting. But um, so it's going to be looking like this blue thing that I called A, okay? And so note that M is private. And the second component, as I mentioned, is phi to power M. Well, Alice doesn't send phi M because it's going to give me exactly the same problem as discrete log, which is not post-quantum, and it's not going to add anything to the literature because it's already been done in a simpler way. So now, for example, here, A is public. And Bob does similar thing. He picks a, he picks a random natural number uh, N and computes uh, just like that G phi to power N. And similar product will come up here that he calls it B uh, and make it public. 
Okay, so your question is, what is the shared key? So I claim that Alice knows B, right? This is public. Alice knows A. Alice knows M. That's her pri private key. Note that Alice doesn't know X, doesn't care, because we claim that uh, the shared key is the um, is a comp is a first component of this product. So Bob knows A, he knows B, and he knows N. Doesn't know why, he doesn't care. And interestingly enough, what Alice can compute, the first component is the same as what Bob can compute, and is equal to G phi to power M plus N. You know, like similar idea that I said the variation of Diffie-Hellman doesn't work here, it works. So the big question here is that, what is the platform? Well, it's not just like mathematics. I say, well, let G to be large enough, N to be large enough, da, 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 right? You want to implement it. You need exactly the same, some parameters, and you need a um, specific group and so on. So we, we are searching for this. So with my former PhD student, uh, Christopher Butterby, now a postdoc in uh, Sorbonne, a colleague at Ludwig Perret at Sorbonne and Siam Akshan at York, we came up with a sub-exponential quantum algorithm for the semi-direct product logarithm problem. I forgot to say that um, what is the semi-direct uh, discrete log problem. So given A in this way, knowing g and phi, finding m is a dis semi-direct discrete log problem. So in general, this, oh, sorry. So in general, we found a sub-exponential quantum algorithm to do it. And this has been presented at uh, fourth uh, post-quantum cryptography conference, standardization conference a couple of years ago, and we published a paper in uh, PQC Crypto um, just this past June. We also went further, and based on this idea, we came up with a so-called uh, digital signature. We called it spot sign. Spot, as you know, in British is potato. <laughs> so spot sign, which is uh, based on this semi-direct product um, discrete log problem. So, any questions so far? Um, let me tell you a few words of the impact of artificial intelligence in post-quantum cryptography and what's been done so far in the space of group-based and in, say, other space like lattice space, which is the one that we are, it's being uh, standardized and deployed and, and so on. So in 2020, uh, 2020, with my former PhD student, Jonathan Gryak uh, here, and uh, Robert Harlick, uh, Pattern Recognition Prize winner, we solved the conjugacy decision problem using machine learning algorithm. So what is a conjugacy decision problem? So you're familiar with it if in the context of, say, um, linear algebra, right? So in general, the conjugacy decision problem is as follows. Given a finitely presented group, does there exist an algorithm to decide whether two words conjugate? So this is, and in general, this problem, there are groups in which this problem is undecidable, is not computable. So machine learning algorithms, pattern recognition algorithms, AI algorithms, uh, the ones that you know deal with real life data, the ones that we really use. And they offer a kind of heuristic algorithm to solve your problem. So you can take the mathematical problem, mathematical data, and feed it into machine learning algorithms and get some ideas of the result. I mean, the kind of uh, groups that we consider here, they're infinite, but still you can have a 
group in which the length of the elements are of some, so have an estimate of some sort. How is it related to cryptography? Well, I told you that, I mentioned to you that conjugacy problem has been used in cryptography. As such, two British mathematicians, after our paper, came up with crypto-analyzing heuristic um, approaches for uh, this crypto system based on conjugacy problem. So that's in 2020. Uh, three years later, so uh, if you remember, I said NIST made the announcement for final round in July 2022, and Lattice Space and Kyber in particular was one of the ones that was chosen. So a few months after, some um, researchers at KT KTH in Stockholm, they came with an uh, AI algorithm. I mean, some part is a side channel attack that, that has been proposed. That uh, was an article saying that AI helps crack NIST recommended post-quantum encryption algorithm. Um, Later on, with a series of papers by Kristen Lauter, um, who's actually currently visiting us at IHP, uh, the head of research at uh, Meta AI in North America, she and her research group came up with a series of paper um, that uh, uses machine learning attack on learning with error. Uh, that is a uh, one of the problems that's been used as a hard problem for lattice-based cryptography. So this is uh, one thing, um, one impact of AI. Of course, um, it um, people still use it. It's not a complete attack. People can uh, use different parameters. So it's also good for crypto analysis. I like to call it more positively rather than so-called attack. But uh, it looks like uh, even if you come up with a post-quantum crypto system, it's not necessarily um, AI resistant. So this is another danger that is uh, coming up. Um, so I mentioned about how AI impacts post-quantum cryptography. So let's see if we could do AI, if we could do machine learning over encrypted big data, the other way around. Um, so this is a topic with many applications. I will mention to you uh, an application in healthcare. Um, but to begin with, I remind you what fully homomorphic encryption is, or we call it FHE. So an encryption function is fully homomorphic if consider E to be an encryption function and consider two messages A and B. So this is a homomorphic with respect to addition if E of A plus B is E of A plus E of B. And the same multiplicatively, E of A times B is E of A times A of B. And it's fully homomorphic encryption if it's homomorphic with respect to addition multiplication at the same time. Because, for example, Diffie-Hellman or RSA that I mentioned, it's homomorphic with respect to multiplication. But having both um, of this cap capability at the same time offers many uh, functionality for us. As such, you can do um, polynomial computation over encrypted data. So, for example, as you could see, e of, if f of x is a polynomial, e of f is the same as f of e of x1 up to x, e of xn. Um, <coughs> So let's look at another example. What is the application? So for example, you have a genome company. And nowadays, um, there are companies in which they don't have their own data centers. And they save their data in some cloud or something, right? 
but they don't want to save it unencrypted. So they save it encrypted database in some cloud, like here. And then in order to do some computation or even just a simple search, whether the client IDM is in this cloud, yes or no, they don't want the cloud to know what they're searching for. And they don't want to decrypt, find the answer and encrypt. It takes time, it's expensive. It, you know, you don't want that. So, so here, um, instead of the genome company ask the cloud, do you know, ask, do you know E of M, encryption of M, of this ID? And cloud does some computation and says yes or no. And based on that, the genome company decrypt the answer and find out about this. But even this is requires some, some work. So a few years ago, um, with my former PhD student, Halam, and a colleague at uh, New York, we came up uh, with a patent that um, it makes not only this uh, idea secure, but also very efficient, because efficiency is also part of the game here. And if you like to see how it works, so we have a plain text, um, plain text space. So you embed it into a ring R, which is a direct sum of some copies of Z, ZP. And the ciphertext space S is another direct sum of several copies of ZP. And you have an ideal I such that S modulo I gives you the plain text R. And the way you encrypt an element U is, um, well, note that the encryption of zero is in this ideal I, and the way you, you do encryption of EU is U plus encryption of zero. So note that, um, so then for the decryption, because ide ideal I is known to the person who wants to decrypt it, so then, um, encryption of zero is going to zero, and then you recover U. And note that this is a symmetric encryption. Um, and in this case, is also um, post-quantum in some ways. What are the applications? So we collaborated with a computational medicine group in University of Michigan, and bioinformatics department as well. So we did, uh, we used this, um, method. Uh, so Alexander Wood is my former PhD student again. So we did private naive based classification of personal biomedical data application of cancer data analysis. So we found some public data to, to work on this. How long do I have, Christina? I think it, uh, five, ten more minutes. Five, ten. Sure, of course, as you, as you like to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So maybe I just tell application of this and then I will stop. And then we can leave some time for questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let me just tell you the application uh, about it. So, so in the United States, we have this Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. And in Europe, you have GDPR. So a wealth of medical data is inaccessible to researchers and clinicians due to privacy restrictions such as HIPAA or GDPR. The medical institutions and companies who own medical uh, information system wish to keep their models private when in use by outside parties. And clinicians would benefit from access to predictive models for diagnosis such as classification of tumors as malignant or benign without compromising patients' privacy. So the goal here that we want is secure, accurate, efficient machine learning and function evaluation over encrypted data. So as I mentioned, the hospital has a patient privacy regulation, has a database send the encrypted database to the research center, 
and the research center has intellectual property protection. So they run their algorithm over encrypted database, they get some result, they send the analysis to the hospital, and the hospital can decrypt it and get their results. So this is a big picture here. And we came up with a university startup, InfoShield, um, which um, compared to what IBM technology did, it's our competition is much faster, perhaps 500,000 times faster over just like a simple computer, nothing really spectacular. So I can stop here. Or I can, I have another 10, 10 miles, so as you wish. I'm happy either way. Shall I stop or go? Um, please continue and finish your presentation. I think everyone enjoys it. Would you be interested or shall I, you're tired? You want to know? Sure, sure. All right. So I, I just give the idea, I don't go to details much. So in this part, I would like to mention about the post-quantum hash functions and blockchain technology. You know that quantum computers put blockchain security at risk. There is a um, natural connection with hash function applications of hash function in blockchain technology. And uh, we just published this paper and just patented it. Um, it's a application of, as I mentioned to you, um, special linear groups, SLNFP. Uh, it's a post-quantum hash function. Uh, so I will tell you quickly about, just to remind you, the definition of hash function. So it's a map phi from natural number to some finite set f such that it's pre-image resistant and it's collision resistant. Um, so this work uh, has been done by two French mathematicians, Tilly Zimor in 1994, and later Charles Laurent Goren in 2008 was published, but Lauter just told me actually they did it in 2005, the lecture I just gave recently. So here, assume that G be a finite group, S be a finite uh, set of generators. And the first attempt that we have here, consider sigma be a bijection from this set to this S. And the way you define phi, uh, consider M, the message, to be I1 up to IL in base K. And it gets sent to phi M which is sigma i1 to sigma i l. And the fact is that if I present it this way, um, this is, uh, you can find collision. So collision, if you have two different messages, m and prime, they're different, but the phi of them are equal. This is not good. This is collision. You could make it a bit more, uh, you could make it more uh, so, um, sophisticated, so have the similar setting as before. Instead, define that sigma to be s times this set to s. Uh, so again, be a bijection. And the way you define it, the hash function phi associated with this triple g s sigma uh, be as follows. So consider m to be i1 to i l in base k minus 1. Define s1 to be sigma s i1 and s lambda to be sigma s lambda 1, lambda minus 1, i lambda. And you define the hash function phi m to be the product of these si's. So keep this in mind, and let's look at these beautiful pictures of geometric interpretations of groups. So in the left side, you have the geometric interpretation of the Cayley graph, that's what we call of z times z, z square. Um, so you see there are, if you look at it, you see there are lots of loops. By loop, I mean circuit. You go from here to here, and you can go from here. You have loop. But if you have so-called free group, there are other types that are, look like free groups. And in this case, 
the Cayley graph looks like a tree. There is no loop. So here, the interesting thing that we want to come up with is that if you have the problem of finding a loop in this Cayley graph, reduces to the collision problem for the hash function phi. So you saw that if you have a free group, which the Cayley graph looks like a tree, right? There is no loop. There is nothing closed. So we want to get this idea and impose it to, um, to, to something finite, but with a very large girth. And we are using this um, pure math uh, theorem by Arjun Seba Biswas that says that if you have n bigger than or equal to 3, there exist two matrices A and B in SL and Z. So as I said, these are n by n matrices with determinant 1 over z integer numbers such that one the group generated by these two matrices is a free group of rank two so that's what we wanted right tree no loop and secondly for every large prime large enough p if you take the element if you take the entries of these matrices find it modulo p so call this matrix AP and BP. So the group generated by these two form um, generate SLNFP. Oh, what did I do? Yeah. So we are, what we do is that uh, using the definition that I mentioned, you can define um, using this theorem you can define a hash function based on this product of these matrices that are special types of matrices such that uh, they're pre-image resistant using this theorem. Using this theorem, uh, the output of a random message will look random and this is a step towards pre-image resistant. Um, and I'm sorry, I go fast. And then um, there is another problem no, known as factorization problem in this case that uh, basically we reduce, uh, we reduce this factorization problem into another hard problem that is shown to be NP-hard in mathematics, which is called, um, uh, the, the problem is called uh, multivariate uh, problem. So it's a system of nonlinear, um, uh, system of uh, multivariate nonlinear equations, which is MP hard, is, is, is very hard. So therefore, is a uh, short algorithm cannot break it in some ways. So these are the examples. I see I'm going to stop. Oh, and then if you also are interested in this topic, uh, currently I'm, uh, I'm running um, a trimester on post-quantum cryptography at IHP. Um, so we still have three workshops. The registration is free, by, but mandatory. We want to know how, uh, we, what to expect. So if you want to come, you're all welcome. Uh, to, to register and come and I uh, on Tuesdays we have you can look at the website um, on Tuesdays we have industry panels so we invite startups working in post-quantum cryptography uh, yeah so if you want to come and actually this Thursday we have a public lecture by Damien Stelle is in French in Mazon Poincaré, you're all welcome to come and register. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.